Uh, my title today is Know Your Identity. When people see you, what do they see? What identifies you? When your children see you, what identifies you to them? When your family members see you, what do they see in you? Do they see Jesus Christ as your identity? Ephesians 1, verse 13, in him you also trusted. After you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Lord, right now, I thank you for what we felt here. God, we, we just sang about we need you, Lord God. And I just pray that you'll help each one of us here today to see our need of you in our life. God, without you, we are nothing. And help us to realize that, God. Help us to understand that without you, we are nothing. Lord, I pray right now, Lord, that you put your seal, your promise on us, your Holy Spirit. Lord, and if somebody doesn't have your Holy Spirit today, God, they can have it also. Hallelujah, Lord God, they can be sealed with your promise. Lord God, with your spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. We live in a world that is full of people who are lost, where many believe that they simply do not fit in. We live in a world where many people are searching for a sense of belonging. They want to belong to someone. They want to belong to something. We live in a time where many people are experiencing the identity crisis. The same problem is facing many Christians today also. What do you mean? In other words, we don't know who we are. We, we've lost our identity. You see, too many people, whether they're young or old, gain their identity from the latest fashions trends or popular expectations from their peers. Many Christians gain their identity more from their family background, work, or human relationships than they do, than they do from their Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. No wonder Paul emphasized that we are in Christ throughout his epistles. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 and 8, even, there, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ. Why? To be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness, grace, that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave us our sins. He showed us his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. Ephesians 1, 11 through 14, furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God, for he chose us in advance. He makes everything work out according to his plan. God's purpose was that he, we, we Jews who were the first to trust in Christ would bring praise to the glory of God. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. I'm telling you folks, God identifies you. He knows who you are, and he wants you to know who you are. Amen. Folks, could it be so easy that one of the greatest problems facing Christianity today and Christians alone today revolves around the identity crisis? Number one result is identity crisis. Folks, we have been conditioned to expect the ordinary routine when life seems to be filled with the routine and the possibility of some extremely good thing happening to us, it seems remote. Sorry. Sadly, we, we, we don't only believe it. 
when it does happen, we can't believe it may happen. I'm saying when God wants to bless his people and God wants to use us, we have a hard time believing that it will be through us. Who, me? We easily find ourselves saying, I can't believe it. Come on. Folks, you're prophesying. I can't believe it. We may not be able to believe it, but it's true. God wants to bless you. God wants to use you. It's true, folks. And we've also been conditioned to believe that we are less than God says we are. In Christ, I'm telling you today, folks, in Christ we are significant. When Christ died on the cross, he paid the penalty for our sin. He died there to, to put to death our old self. He died there to enable us to receive his life. And as we surrender to him, hear me? As we surrender to him, he gives us his life in exchange for our life. God becomes our life. We live by his life. In he, he in us and we in him. And now we live from this new level of life. His righteousness is made our righteous. See, we have been conditioned that we have nothing to offer Come on, folks. The devil is feeding a lie to you. You see, but in Christ, we are sufficient. Amen. As we enter into a relationship with our God, God empowers us to speak his word, to act as he himself spoke and acted on this earth. As we diminish, he increases in us. As we let go of our understanding, his truth grows in us. As we acknowledge our weakness, his power is magnified in us. As we follow him, his life-giving word is enabled, is able to go forth from us. As, and, and, and as he enabled us to express and cast out the unclean spirits, so we too will be ones who bring healing and wholeness to a world. We have been conditioned to see everything familiar and ordinary. And when things become ordinary, they sometimes seem to lose their importance in our lives. And when things begin to lose their importance, there is a temptation for them to be neglected. There is a temptation to do just enough sometimes to get by. There's a temptation to do with our eyes half open, to do them half heartily, and to go only halfway. Am I talking to somebody today here? Come on, folks. We get to, things get to see, seem ordinary. It's not so important to us. We, we just kind of stumble around in our walk. This is the lifelong pervasive temptation to do things halfway. And the temptation not only affects our work, but it affects our relationships, our church. It affects our spiritual condition. I'm telling you, God wants your all, folks. God wants all of you. He don't want just half of you. <clears throat> Listen, the goal of the enemy, the goal of the enemy is to steal the identity of the Jesus Christ believers. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 13, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, and against the rulers of darkness in this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand the enemy tries to bring spiritual struggles to churches why you say pastor we, we are to a threat to Satan. I'm telling you, he wants to bring struggles to us because he understands what a threat we can be to his kingdom. Satan is threatened by a powerful church that is on fire for God. Satan is threatened by COP, demonstration of the love of God to all the people. Satan is threatened by Church of Pentecost trying to transform our community and demonstrating God's heart in, this, in our neighborhoods. Satan is threatened by Church of Pentecost who 
enables people to enjoy more abundant life through fellowship with God. Satan is threatened by, by what we are accomplishing. Satan is threatened by our generous giving. He is threatened by the Sunday school that we have here at TOP. Satan is threatened by our identity if we will show it forth to a world. Let people see who you are in Jesus Christ. That is a threat to Satan. Amen. That is a threat to his kingdom. You see, the demonic forces of Satan's army, they are deployed everywhere in our culture. They infiltrate every civic of society, both secular and escalational. They have but one purpose, and that is to destroy God's work. Their attack takes many forms. They attack God's work directly and indirectly. And they are after you, folks. They are after your walk with God. They are after your worship. They are after your joy of God. They are after your family. They are after your relationship with others. The enemy will attack you through your emotions. He will attack you through your circumstances, and they do not sleep. Don't think they're going to take a break from you. They want to take you down. Folks, it is very real. It is a very personal struggle. In our own strength, we have overmatched. We are overmatched in our own strength. You see, folks, we need God, amen, to war against these things in our life. Amen. You need to understand how to fight your battles. You see, the armies armed for battle are not of this earth. This is no new foe, folks. This enemy has been around since the beginning of time. And in this conflict, there is more at stake than there, were, than there was all in all of our wars combined. Amen? Because, you see, understand, the enemy is armed and dangerous. And we must learn how to be armed and dangerous ourselves. You hear me today, folks? We must be learned. We learn how to be armed and dangerous ourselves to his kingdom. We need to determine in our lives that I am going to live for God and I'm going to take everybody I can with me. Come on, let's go right back at him. I want you to understand something today, folks. This battle that we are in counts. This is the battle that we must make certain that we win. This is not, this is not the, folks, understand this is the last stand if we don't stand for who is. You need to help your children understand this is a battle we're in, and we're going to win this, son, daughter. It is the spiritual battle against the demonic forces of hell. Understand, let me ask you some important questions. How do you see yourself as a Christian? Come on, how do you see yourself as a Christian today? Do you see yourself as powerful Christian, or do you see yourself as impotent? Do you understand the true extent of what it means to have the power of God living inside of you? Do you see yourself as a person who can do all things through Jesus Christ? Do you see yourself as a person who will do all things through Jesus Christ? Do you see yourself as a person who has the same mission as Jesus Christ? Folks, let me ask you something. Are you a thermostat or thermometer? Are you one who impacts your world or merely an indicator of what the climate is? You see, in today's ever-changing culture, we as Christians, we must decide it will be mere indicators of of climate of God-ordained reforms. Our world is forever attempting to press us into a mold and and a mindset We are told to wear our values loosely, and there are no absolute truths in this world. Anyone who disagrees is a right-wing religious fanatic, and everyone lies a little bit to get ahead, they tell you. Who won't steal if they have a chance? It's the world thinks. What's the harm with a little bit of pornography? What I do... In the privacy of my home is my business as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else. That's what the world thinks, folks. What's the big deal 
about a few four-letter words. Our kids hear worse in schools anyways. Everybody steals business supplies. Of course, I'd keep that spare change. <clears throat> I wouldn't tell them I broke the return product. The Lord helps those who help themselves. This is the world's mindset, folks. You see, Daniel, Daniel's introduction here. Let me talk to you about Daniel and his background. In Daniel chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, in the third year of the reign of Jechiah, king of Judah, came to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon in Jerusalem, and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jechiah, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of the, his gods. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. Let's look at the lesson from Daniel in Daniel 1. Through three through six, it says, And the king spake unto Ephesus, Ephesus, the master of his eunuchs, and that he should bring certain of the children of Israel, of the king's seed, and the and the princes, and the children of whom with no blemish, but we but well favored and skillful in all wisdom, and cunning in knowledge, and understand science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning of the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them daily provisions of the king's meat and the wine that he which he drank. So nourishing them three years, that at the end of thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Daniel 1, 17 through 19. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of these days... That the king had said he should bring them in. Then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king communed with them. And among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mikael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. You see, folks, God knows our potential. And I want you to understand, God secures our purpose. Amen? In Psalms 139, 13, for you created in my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Jeremiah 1, 5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Philippians 2, 13, for God is at work within you, helping you want to obey him, and then helping you to do what he wants. You see, folks, our identity is in Jesus Christ. It is not in our world. It is not in our buildings. It is not in our city. It is in nothing else but Jesus. That is our identity. <laughs> nothing else. Our identity begins and ends with Jesus. He is our creator, he is our sustainer, and he is our final judge. And I want you to understand something. Daniel understood this. Daniel would not let the king determine his identity. Only God could determine Daniel's identity. How about you today? What determines your identity? Is it your job? Is it your family? Is it your, your materialistic things in life? What is it that determines your identity? Daniel says, listen here, king, I'll help you, uh, but I ain't doing certain things because God is my identity. Daniel would not let the king determine his identity. We let the things of this world determine our identity sometimes. In Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, so here is what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, your eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it with even, without you with even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You will be changed from the inside out, readily recognizing what He wants from you, and quickly 
quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. God brings the best out in you, develops well-informed maturity in you. Daniel 1, 5, the king assigned them daily rations of food and wine from his own kitchens. They were, to they were to be trained for three years and when they would enter the royal service. You see, they were to be educated, folks, for three years. And at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. But Daniel 1 verse 8 says, But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and the wine given to him by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat the unacceptable foods. You see, when you face corruptive influence in the world, you need to have some solid convictions. That will not fail you. Hear me. When the world comes at you and the pressure of the world to do what it wants you to do, you need to have some convictions that will not fail you. Amen? When, trading the, when you're treading the murky waters of life, God's convictions will never fail you, folks. Conviction is the mortar of the morality in our lives. Two important things to consider today. The radius of your fence, is that radius too narrow? Is it too restrictive? Is your radius too loose? Is it too broad? Is it too few morals to guide you? And the second one, what is the height of your fence? Can we easily circumvent our moral belief? Or do we live by the alterable views or virtues? Evaluation, what kind of fence do you have? You see, we don't like them sometimes, but I'm going to tell you sometimes they're, they're a blessing in your life. Not only should we live by the things God wants, but we should have our own. So we should adopt them as our own. Do we live at the extremes of legalism with its restrictiveness or anarchy? Which values neither tell, neither, uh, which, which values neither self or others? Or do we have a solid, objective set of values that is based on scriptural principles? And if we do have such solid set of scriptural values, how meaningful are they to you? Is it just when you, is it important for you? Or beneficial to you? Or is it something that you live by in every, when, they, when somebody's not even around? Folks, if you want to test your footing... Hear me today. If you want to test your footing where you're at in your values, walk against the crowd. Come on. It'll test you. It'll show you right where you're at. When the crowd's just coming, flowing fast by you, walk against them sometimes. See where your footing is. See where you stand. See if you can hold up. Amen? Amen. If you want to know if you're standing on, on the, a true, solid foundation, let your principles come under fire one time. See if you give in. Come on. <laughs> come on, Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Come on, folks. I'm telling you what. You see, I have to make it, I have to make it true in my life, amen, because I have people watching me. I have children that are living for God, thank God, and I'm not going to back down, amen. I have grandchildren that are living for God. I'm not going to back down. I have a church that I love dearly, and I pastor, and I'm not going to back down, amen. I don't care what the crowd is doing. I want to live for God. Come on. We can't give in to every little whim. Come on, test where you're at. So many people only care about themselves. They don't care what their children think. They don't care what anybody else thinks. I'm telling you, you need to care. Weak principles will fail quickly. Come on. You see, Daniel was tested, folks. In Daniel 1, chap uh, chapter 1, verse 15 to 16, and at the end of 10, uh, 15, I'm sorry, at the end of 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. 
You see, folks, in Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 14, a final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the, uh, God's armor so that you will not be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, uh, but against evil rulers and authorities uh, of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. Therefore... Put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after that battle, you will be able to be standing firm. You see, the wise person knows how to learn from the wisdom of other people without being overcome by it. John, John Daniel said that. There's a song that says, my hope is built on nothing less. In Jesus' blood and righteousness, I dare not trust the sweet frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Folks, I'm telling you today, Daniel 1, 17 through 20, God gave these, foot, these four youths great ability to learn. And they soon mastered all of the literature and the science of the time. And God gave it to Daniel's special ability to understand the meaning of dreams and vision. And when the three-year training period was completed, the superintendent brought all the young men to the king for oral exams. And as he had been ordered to do, to do the king never Nebuchadnezzar had long talks with each of them, and none of them impressed him as much as Daniel, Hananiah, Mihael, and Azariah. So they were put on his regular staff of advisors. And in all matters requiring information and balanced judgment, the king found three these young men as a vice ten times better than all of the skilled magicians and wise astrologers in his realm. You see, sometimes it looks like we need to go with the crowd because how are we going to get ahead? But I'm telling you, if you stand your ground, it may be lonely for a while, but God will have your back, and God will bless you. He'll anoint you. He'll use you in areas that you never thought possible. Contrary to the world's wisdom, which equates a strong moral code with ignorance and narrow-mindedness. That's how they look at things that we hold dear. It's ignorant. It's narrow the greatest test of wisdom is one's commitment to virtue. 1 Corinthians 1, 25, For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Folks, obedience has its rewards. As a credit card commercial, membership has its rewards. Obedience to God's membership has its rewards. Romans 10, 11, as the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. God will never let us down. He will never let us down. In Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. You believe that today? Stand with me in this house. Stand with me. <clears throat> we have a choice, folks. We have a choice to fit in or to stand out. To go with the flow or to run against the wind. I ask you, what is your choice? What is your choice? And will your choice help you? Will your choice that you make help you know your identity? I'm going to stand with God. Listen, I'm not perfect. I know that. But if I fall, I'm going to get right back up. Amen. I want to be a good example. Amen. I want it said to me that there's a man that stood for something that was right. He didn't just go with the flow. I used to be made fun of a lot in school. Because I was different. People make fun of you when you're different. They don't know what to do with you. But I thank God, folks, that I am what I am. And I'm not what I used to be. 
Amen. Hallelujah. I love this life living for Jesus Christ. I love it. Amen. It's not always easy, but it's the best thing I can do to live for God, to stand for what is right. Amen. I want to stand for what is right. I want to be pleasing to my God, and I want to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I don't want to just skate by. I want to make a difference in my world. And I pray today that there's some people here that make up their mind today. If you've never made up your mind to do it, I pray that you make up your mind. I am going to make a difference in my world. Let me, let me, let me tell you something. I've, I've thought about this sometimes long and hard. And you know, you hear sometimes of abuse in the police departments and things of that nature, and different things, different people in charge of things. And I've been convinced in my heart that I believe that most people go into those positions believing that they want to make a difference in their world. But because of all the, har the harshness that comes against them day after day after day, and the disappointment day after day after day, they sometimes turn dirty. And I believe that we as Christians sometimes can do that. But I want the love of God in my life, and I want to make a difference, and I want to love people like God loved me. God, help me to never get hard-hearted to where I don't want to tell somebody about you. Help me, Lord, to not care about somebody who's going to hell. God, help me to love no matter what. You say, Brother Robert, what do you mean? I said, folks, I've had a lot of hurt. I've had a lot of people that call themselves Christians hurt me pour yourself into people sometimes and they just kick you and it's so easy sometimes just to give up and say why do I want to help anybody but I want my identity to be in him and he is love and he did so much he sacrificed so much for me I want to sacrifice for him Folks, I, I pray that you want to put your identity in Jesus Christ today. I pray that you make a choice in your life today that says, I want to be what God wants me to be. I want to change my world. I have neighbors that need God. I have family members that need God. I work with people that need God. Come on, folks. Is there anybody here that wants the identity of Jesus Christ in your life? This altar is open today. Come on, if you're here and you need the Holy Ghost to help you to be, have that identity of Jesus Christ. You can have the Holy Ghost here today. Caught up in the 